Grenadine, I've heard speak a couple of times to an organization, uh, the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph. They have a, a project, they have a lecture series that meets um, in, at Los Luceros, the historic Los Luceros, down near Alcalde, mm -hmm. before or after, on uh, the last Tuesdays mm -hmm. of the month. And Glenna has spoken there a couple of times, and um, I've heard this talk before, and it's fascinating. But Glenna trained in archaeology and botany, and she's the former New Mexico State archaeologist, and retired three years ago from the executive director of the Northern Rio Grande his Heritage Area. She's also a spinner and weaver, and has a special interest in natural dyes, and I've heard you talk about those. Um, but her personal and professional interests led her to study farming in northern New Mexico before the Spanish arrived, and especially was noting the farming with rocks to grow crops, including native cotton. So, Linda. Ah, thank you. <laughs> farming with rocks is one of my interests. Uh, and turns out it has a distinct and long-lived history in connection with cotton grown by native peoples before Columbus. So we're going to just go into science and Latin for a moment here. Um, there's a lot of things about cotton that I certainly didn't know when I first started all this research. But uh, the genus is Gossypium. It dates back, as you can see there, 5 to 10 million years. It's in the same family, the Malvaceae, as hibiscus and globe mallow, okra, uh, a number of showy flowered plants that, uh, and I have a, a little cotton plant that I brought with me that happens to be in flower. When we're done with the talk, I'll bring up the plant. It's under the table right now. And you can look at the flower and you will instantly recognize that you've seen this kind of flower before elsewhere. And it's all in the Malvaceae or the Mallow family. The original Gossypium species are perennials, or at least they're, they grow as perennials in tropical uh, areas. They can be grown as annuals and typically are outside the tropics. What I find most interesting is that the old world cottons, there's basically four major centers of domestication of cotton across the world. And people have domesticated four different species of cotton, gossypium, four different times in history. At least four different times. And the old world cottons, India and Africa, are what they call diploid species. They have two sets of chromosomes. All of the cottons in the New World are tetraploids. They have four sets of chromosomes. So it's not so simple as to say, well, you know, the ocean currents brought seeds from the Old World into the New World, and that's how we got cotton over here. This goes back millions of years. I was talking to John earlier, uh, back when the continents were stuck together in Pangaea. Basically, the ancestors of cotton um, became present. And the continents, the continents drifted because of tectonic plates and la di da By the time the continents were truly separated is when the New World cottons automatically duplicated their chromosomes. Plants do this on occasion. It may be true that lower life forms of animals do as well. I'm not really certain. Not really certain on that point. And so that's how the New World cottons are different than the Old World cottons. The New World and the Old World cottons cannot cross. The numbers of chromosomes are just wrong. Even if you cut the number in half for meiosis and then put them back together for uh, the completed organism, um, it just doesn't work out. Uh, it does apparently, um, it is a fact, this is a new fact to me, so it's almost like still a factoid, but I just learned this reading some more about the origins of Sea Island cotton off the barrier islands of the Carolinas. And apparently that plant was developed in the uh, 18th century by a deliberate cross between Gossypium barbadense, which is the Peruvian South American genus and species, and Gossypium hirsutum, which is the genus species of North America, Central America and North America. And it produced a cotton that was grown as, a, as an annual, but it is potentially a perennial plant, it had the longest staple of any fiber on a cotton outside of Egyptian cotton. Huge difference from the staple length for the cottons that are ordinarily grown in the North and South American places. 
The South American tetraploid species, that's Gossypium barbadense, produces colors. And a lot of your Peruvian textile artifacts are colored not with dyes, but with co cotton that grew in those colors. And the Spanish, when they first came to Peru, wrote about the cottons they saw on the plants in the field. And since they were only familiar with white cotton, the diploid species back in Europe and Spain, they wrote in their journals that the Indians must have dyed these cottons and then put them back on the plants to dry. <laughs> and you interpret things from your own experience, so this is not to say these people were being absurd, but it does speak to the fact that they were astonished to see that cotton could grow in colors. And it happens that in Mexico, your perennial cottons uh, of the Gossypium hirsutum genus and species do grow in brown, but only brown. And we don't have the colors that the Spanish uh, wrote in their journals of reds and blues and yellows and greens. And they had one that was yellow and black spots. And I would kill to see a cotton that was yellow with black spots. Most of those cottons in Peru now are extinct uh, because the Peruvian government, wanting to improve the lot and life of Peruvian citizens in world trade, has given premiums to farmers to get rid of the colored cotton and grow white cotton instead. So we have a few farmers and some American people, uh, scientists, who've been working with those farmers trying to find a way for them to be economically supported in their efforts to continue to grow colored cotton. And when we're done with the talk, I'll ask you to come up to the table. I have three different uh, balls of cotton, colored cotton, from Peru. Uh, there's a green, a brown, and a lavender. And um, there's a story that we'll do here, uh, pioneering work about from Sally Fox. She's the one that also crossed colored Barbadense species with white Gehirsutum species in um, California as graduate student. And so she's invented the first annual colored cottons uh, that we've ever seen in, in the world. So, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, I like a, an informal talk. Clearly, I'm not reading from a script. So uh, if you guys have questions or something, please just interrupt me and we'll address those questions. If I'm dwelling on a topic, just tell me to move on and um, we'll see if we can do that. So there's a number of myths that I want to try and dispel. Uh, I gave this talk to some, um, I would call them robber barons of King Cotton that asked me to give a talk to them. And of course, these are the guys that are with Monsanto and Dow. And these are the guys that have tailored modern cotton grown in the United States to grow to a certain height, all, and then they stop, and then all the cotton becomes ripe at the same time, so you can pick it by machine, and it's heavy on use of water, heavy herbicides, heavy insecticides, heavier defoliants, defoliants and all this. And I just wanted to kind of tweak them a little bit. So I said, myth one, Europeans brought cotton to the New World, and that's clearly untrue. Spanish explorers wrote about growing cotton and spinning and weaving cotton clothing by the Pueblo people in their multi-storied villages, which rivaled anything they had seen in Spain. And they export, exported Pueblo woven cotton blankets to Mexico as tribute for centuries. And unfortunately, there's not a single one of those blankets left that we could look at. So that is a close up of a Pueblo woven cotton manta. Manta is the Spanish word for a Pueblo wearing blanket. They're about five feet on a side and they're woven on the upright looms that we now associate with the Navajo people. But in fact, the Pueblo people taught the Navajo people how to weave, and it was on those upright looms. The Pueblo people, by and large, no longer weave for all kinds of historical reasons, but the Navajo people have kept that up as, as part of their own adoption of the weaving techniques. So you see there uh, a cotton, sorry, a tassel, a corner tassel. It worked a minute ago. There corner tassel, just like you would see in the four corners of a Navajo blanket. And the cotton there is obviously all hand spun. There's different uh, sizes of yarn. And the border is not, does not have a three, uh, three yarn intertwine like a Navajo blanket does. It's just a simply go to the edge and then come back. This was supposed to be uh, this specimen is supposed to have come from a, a Pueblo burial. 
And I think it's an ethnographic piece that was collected from Hopi Pueblo when they probably in the early 1900s or maybe the late 1800s because it's absolutely pure white. There are no stains from being in the ground or anything else on this, this uh, garment. Examples of cotton clothing worn by people in the Southwest before Columbus. And some of these are quite old. In fact, most of them are. We'll see if we can get the work again. This is a wearing blanket. You can see the little tassels. And it's tie-dyed. This is the only photo of this blanket that I've ever seen. In all the places that shows this picture, just blow it up or make it small, it's the same picture. So uh, there's not a lot of information about it except that it's dark. And what's happened before they dyed this cotton manta was they tied squares or diamonds with string to re resist the dye before they then immerse the entire uh, textile in a very large vessel to then soak up the dye. When it was dyed, they took the string out and left the white diamonds. They also left the very tip of the, the wrapped areas open, as you can see the little black dot in the middle, or dark dot in the middle of the diamond. This is one of the few tie-dye textiles that we have from prehistory. This dates at least, well, I would say no later than the 13th century AD. <clears throat> I'll also say, that having seen other mantas, I've not seen this one, they're about this, the, the weight of a, of a sweatshirt, a cotton sweatshirt. It's not like a shirt. It's a heavy duty sort of a, a garment. So it would take 25 to 50 gallons of dye to immerse that, that garment five feet on a side in enough dye for it to soak it up and then take the color. And we've never, I can say as an archeologist, we've never seen pottery that large from the cultural areas that produce these, these textiles. So it's always been a wonderment of mine and part of another talk about how they could have accomplished this tie-dye of this, this garment. Secondly is a shoe sock over here. This is knotless netting and it's a yucca fiber. Uh, apparently there, there was just the yucca up here, but down here you see it's kind of woolly looking and then there's a, a hard sole on it. So that's the shoe sock, and the yucca yarn was um, covered with uh, fur, so rabbit skin fur, most likely, wrapped around the yucca yarn before it was then made into the shoe sock, but the, oh, I'm not, I keep saying yucca, this one is cotton, I'm sorry, cotton yarn. Here we have another cotton manta, again with corner tassels, five feet on a side, mas o menos, and woven with yarns that were colored before they were woven in. And that the colors of the black, the red, and the yellow, and the white are still bright after centuries of you know, a lifetime of use, burial, excavation. We don't really know where these things come from. Uh, whether somebody ran it through the washing machine, as does happen with ancient textiles. Uh, whether it was displayed inappropriately, say, under fluorescent lighting, whatever, before it came to the museum. And those colors are still bright. So it became a research question of mine, again, to try to figure out where the red dyes came from, because red is possibly the most difficult dye in the world of plant dyes to reproduce. And then lastly, this is a cotton man's shirt done in the spraying braiding technique. Spraying is a uh, Scandinavian word because spraying is a kind of braiding, but if you think of braiding your hair, You've got the hair on your head, but all of the other ends of the hair are free. They hang free. So you swap one whole section of hair for another, you know, to make your braid. Spraying is done where both ends of the braid, or the, the warp as it is, is continuous. There are no free ends. So what you do, and there's no weft, so it's not like weaving. What you're doing is taking groups of warp threads in a pattern and transposing them across a row with the next row, transposing those, and the, you end up with a lace pattern. I don't know how well this, sh this uh, slide is showing up, but it's, it looks a whole lot like a Mesa Verde mug, something like that, but if you start dividing this in halves to see where the repeats are, there's no repeats on this. It's not symmetrical, that's what I'm trying to say. And it turns out that this symmetry turns at the shoulder. So the back is exactly like this, except a mirror image. It is a masterwork. Um, 
Friends of mine just finished making three replicas of this shirt, one for the University of, sorry, for the Arizona State Museum, where the original is kept, because the tribe that claims descent from the group that made this, not that we know who that was really, this again dates no later than 13th century, and they're starting to think it is more like the 11th century AD at this point. This tradition doesn't spring from nowhere. So there's a long history of this technique in the New World, which is big news for Europe and um, big news for textile researchers in the New World. So. And where are these today? Most of these, most of these are in Arizona at the museums there. The preservation is better in Arizona than here, but the cultural groups are very similar. And I've seen fragments, I've seen a lot of fragments, of mantas like this at the, um, the museums in Santa Fe and their collections, and they come from New Mexico sites. So even though my samples uh, are Arizona, we, our, our ancient people here had them as well. Okay, myth two, New World cotton is white, just like Old World. Well, that's not true. Um, here's your Mexican cotton in the lower right growing in a reddish brown. I apologize for this, the quality of these photos. I, you'll be happier to see them up here in person. But the ones at the top are this lavender, this mauve, this FIFO color. It's um, a little more clear on the table. If you look at the brown spots that have been uh, spun into the fiber and then compare it with the white fiber that's at the other end of this particular length of yarn in that ball, that ball. Uh, you can see that it's not, it's not red, it's not green, it's not yellow, it's not brown, it's something in between. So that's what they're calling lavender. And it, these, um, that is from a Peruvian source. Now the Peruvian cottons grow in very dark browns like uh, dark chocolate to all kinds of gradations of milk chocolate. And then most of your Mexican cottons grow in, like I say, this reddish brown. Okay, cotton breeding is a more modern science. No, sir. Uh, the picture there is of a um, Gossypium hirsutum Hopi, the Hopi short staple 90 day wonder clamp. I didn't say that yet. The Hopi people took the cottons that were changed from perennials to annuals south of Arizona because you have to have enough time for plants to grow to get a, a seed from that crop so that you can begin to start practicing selection of seeds from the earliest plant that grow that next year. And then the first bowl from that plant, you save those seeds, you plant those the next year. Over a human lifetime, you might take, knock a couple days off of the life cycle of that particular strain that you're working on. But to reduce a plant that grows at the Arizona border in 120 days, which is still fast for cotton, to 90 days, which is what you have at Hopi, seed to bowl, takes a lot of human lifetimes. And I think this is an underappreciated fact for, for the effort that people deliberately and consciously and, and scientifically put into this effort to make cotton available and able to grow in the shorter growing seasons with a lot of cold at the beginning and the end of the growing season, like at Hopi, or as it turns out from my work in northern New Mexico. It did lose its color in the process, and now it makes only white cotton. Whenever you pro uh, domesticate anything, oftentimes color is one of the first things to go. You think about all the white turkeys and the white chickens and the white bunnies and uh, various other kinds of white animals that have colored relatives in the wild. And you start to narrow the, the desired traits so, so much that cotton, sorry, that color just sort of falls, falls out. A New World annual cotton requires a long growing season. No, it doesn't. Here is the area that, co that the cotton gardens, the, the gravel mulch fields that we'll talk about in a second, are found. So this is, you've got Santa Fe and Albuquerque, Taos is up here. This is basically Española, and this is the Rio Chama, and then the Rio Ojo Caliente. This is the Tewa, uh, ancestral Tewa homeland. So the Tewa people are your middle, or no, sorry, your northern Rio Grande Pueblos. I don't, can't remember all eight or nine of them, but 
It's San Juan, Santa Clara, Tezuki, Nambe, Tezuki, Picaris. Oh, it's no, not Picaris. Not Taos. No, not Taos. Uh, there's a couple of more. And it was the ancestors of those people that then grew the cotton, as near as we can tell. So here's your figures about 120 days and your figures of 90 days. Okay. Prime farmland. Uh-uh. <laughs> this is one of my favorite slides. I sure hope you all can see it. There is a line of rocks. Come on, come on, come on. There you go. I'm having to hold the battery. Right there. And you can see there's white dots here and there are no white dots here. This is the cobble border of a gravel mulched field. This is a juniper tree. This is a person for scale. And it was in, well, we have another slide that'll show you where I got the dirt sample or where the archeologists collected the dirt sample for me that I then discovered cotton pollen to be preserved in, which means, and we'll get into the biolo bi biology of cotton a little bit in a minute, but it, it means the cotton was grown in that field. And this is new news uh, back in 1994, and it's still being expanded in uh, mostly tribal areas in northern New Mexico in the, that little study area that I showed you on the other map. Unfortunately, because the studies are being funded by the tribes, they are not uh, allowing me or anybody else except the researchers there to know where this additional information has been found. So I can tell you that it's, it's found in these rock fields in that study area, but where, or if, if it's even outside that study area now, I don't know. Oh, I see those arrows don't even cook up at all. That must be the switch from PC to, okay. to Apple. Yeah, th those so kind of on the same lines. On the same lines, yeah. <laughs> uh, these are placed not anywhere near a, a water or an arroyo or anything else. Hand diagram. If you have a river and it's in a, a valley and you come up from that river as you hike up, you know, you'll go up an incline, there'll oftentimes be a pediment or a plateau or a bench, a geological bench, and then you'll start to walk up some more, another bench, up, and you might end up at the top at that point. These fields are planted on the benches. It's not level ground, it is slightly sloping ground. What that means is that rainfall and snow up here melt and run downhill. They also run downhill under the surface of the soil. But they water then the fields that are on that bench. And water and snow that falls on this bench melts and falls down on this next one. Eventually it'll reach down to the river, but these fields were never irrigated by uh, bringing water up from the river. These fields can cover hectares. That's lots and lots of acres. And there's way too many of them to have been watered by human effort. And a lot of people have said, well, didn't they exhaust the soil? And, you know, not all this was planted at one time. And that is something that we're still trying to understand. But I can tell you that after these, well, I didn't tell you that these fields appear around 1250 AD and they, they end around 1500. So just before the Spanish got this far north, the people had quit farming in these fields and they had moved down to the rivers, the major rivers, um, the Rio Grande and the Chama to uh, build their uh, pueblos and farm in less risky locations. This is pretty tightly correlated to the Little Ice Age, so-called up this direction, where the, by the time of the 1500s, the growing season had decreased to the point where even the heat saving, the heat retaining aspects of a gravel mulch and the water protecting from evaporation aspects of the gravel were not enough to be able to bring a crop to, um, to a final form. Okay, rocks are just rocks, right? And I'm hoping, I've, I've got some fairly obvious slides here, but can you see this line and how there are horizontal lines coming out from it? Yes? Okay. 
This one's a little messier. Uh, there's a line of rocks here, and there's scattered rocks, but there is a line. Typically, rocks don't line themselves up, so these we call rocks out of place. They're out of place because people picked them up and moved them. This one should be very obvious. And again, parallel lines coming off from the center line. These are subdivisions of the grids, or they are the grids that make up the name of the grid fields. They vary in size. Uh, they can be the size of this room easily, one of those subdivisions. More rocks out of place. Here, this is a nice corner on this one. And this one actually produced cotton pollen. Um, right here is the lens cap of a camera, right there. So these are smaller subdivisions, but it did produce cotton pollen. And so then the question becomes, why the subdivisions? And being monocrop type agricultural people are in our culture, uh, Folks want to know, well, did they plant corn in one square, and did they plant, you know, or did, were all the squares planted in corn, and they put the beans someplace else, and all the rest of it. And I think that the answer is more along the lines of crops that needed a little bit more water may have been planted next to this largest rock, and plants with needing a little less water might have been planted in the middle of the grid square, f further away from where the rocks themselves would harvest water and then store it underneath them where it wouldn't evaporate. So those are some subtleties that I can't tease out with the pollen. Forgot to tell you, I'm trained not only in botany, but my specific training is in pollen. So I, when I was active, was identifying pollen grains from soil samples to figure out what plants had contributed to what they call the pollen rain that then falls down on the soil surface. More rocks, right? Well, by now you know the answer is no. Um, this is a grid square, and there's this rock and this rock, both of which have, that have had a chip knocked out of either side of one end, just as this one has and this one. All four of these rocks were found in the squares of these gravel mulch fields. And the best we can tell is their hose. Now, Having made and farmed a little bit in some gravel small test type gravel mulch fields, I can tell you that a hoe is not real helpful, but nonetheless it is a tool that is found only in these fields, and it's the only tool found in these fields. Uh, there's not a lot of pottery because you don't need pottery when you're just growing crops, and these are way far away from your home, from the Pueblos, and they are places that people walk to. So you're not carrying water, you're carrying your lunch. Or you're gonna eat rabbits and caterpillars when you get there. So this is the experiment, and these are hideous slides, and I really apologize. I had four test squares. This one is all cobbles, cobble border, and then cobbles on the inside. Cobble border, and this is actually the same field, with gravel on the inside. And then over here is gravel, but no cobble border. And then the fourth one was in the place of this here, was just a field with no cobbles and no uh, gravel, no nothing. And those plants just up and died just as fast as they could. You know, and I planted the same native crops in each one. So the crops in the border, uh, sorry, the cobble, the 100% cobble, they sprouted in a week. It's pretty fast. But they never got tall enough um, to go above the cobbles because they kept getting knocked over by the wind. They didn't develop any strength because they hadn't been treated to wind when they were small. Instead, they were treated to wind when they got big. And, you know, spindly plants, if you ever grow those in the peat pots, they get too big and they're just, they can't cope with the world. So this was uh, very fast as far as sprouting, but I got no crop from this field. The, um, I got no crop from the uh, one with no treatment. Both of these um, gravel mulch fields gave me a crop those seeds sprouted in about 10 days, and they grew slowly because they were ex exposed to wind. I was using the, te the control plot, the one with no rocks of any sort, to tell me when to water, because they, they, they just lost water really fast. So every time I watered the control, I would water these others as well, and I measured my water and gave everybody the same amount. 
The crop was um, about the same from both of those gravel mulch fields, but I noticed that when I watered the ones with the, the one with the cobble border, that the water didn't run out of that field as fast as it did from, the, from its neighbor that just had the gravel mulch. So I figure you know, it's not much of an experiment, there's not, not many variations on this, it's not scientific to, sounds scientific, but it's probably not. Nonetheless, it, it suggests to me why cobble borders might have been created for the fields. So, rocks out of place make a subtle cultural landscape. In these two pictures, I'm standing basically in the same place in the Rio del Oso, in one of the benches uh, and the uh, gravel mulch field that is there. So all the rocks that you see here, the white ones and the dark ones, are essentially out of place. Uh, it doesn't make the nice pattern of the grid fields in the rest of the slides that you've seen, because my purpose here was to show how far we are from the river. That's the Rio del Oso all the way down there. So this is at least one bench here, here's a second bench, and then the third bench that I'm standing on. You can see that there's no way to get water coming uphill. In fact, if it's going anywhere, it's going downhill to the river. And the same here, you've got the line of cottonwoods at the river, at least one bench, and then the one that I'm on. And it's interesting, you can stand at least in the Rio del Oso. The, the valley is, um, narrow enough that you can stand on the, on the slopes of, on one side of the Rio del Oso and look across the Rio to the slopes of the valley on the other side in the early spring, and you'll see these squares of green before anything else turns green. And those are the gravel mulch fields. They're still working, even though they were abandoned around 1500. And this is one of the things that persuades me that the idea of soil exhaustion doesn't really work because you think that people use the analogies with China where people rake out the gravel every year and then put it back after they fertilize the soil, and I figure that's just a whole lot of people that need a job in China because um, it just doesn't seem to be the case here, especially if you think about growing your crops in a non-monocrop non -monocrop fashion where you have different plants in the same squares, whether that square is as big as this or is as big as that table. Crops that need more water probably go next to the, the rocks themselves, and then the rest of it is filled in with other crops, but they're not necessarily even domesticated plants. If you're growing kota, I don't know if you guys have Navajo tea up here, okay? That's a, uh, it's a dye, it's a dye plant. It's a, an herbal tea. And um, it's a condiment, so that would, if it came up in your field, and it's also a perennial, I think you'd probably let it be there. And if pepperweed wanted to grow someplace, that's the little seeds there add uh, flavor to your food. So you're probably not going to pull that up just for sake of um, pure agriculture. You're probably going to let it grow. So you have different soil amendment and extraction going on at the same time by the, the fact of the very diversity of plants that are growing in any part of a gravel field. And I think that goes a long way toward preserving soil fertility. That said, I'm not sure really how we would find evidence of fertilization in, in, a, gra in a, a gravel mulch field through archeological means. And um, the soil scientists that I've worked with are really not very interested in this technique. So because you can't grow anything in this, in this place because uh, modern agriculture is very water dependent. It's uh, fertilizer and herbicide dependent. You have to be able to uh, gather your crop with machinery. You're not gonna hire people to go out there and pick stuff by hand. So farming in these lands, even though they supported thousands of people at a time across that study area, it's useless as farmland today and is used for, for grazing. I think it's a really potent statement about technology and how it bites you in the butt. This is an aerial shot about 500 feet above the ground on Abiquiu Mesa, and each of those white rectangles is a grid square filled with snow. The dark things are juniper trees, and so you can get a sense of scale. That's uh, a lot of acres there. And they are contiguous. The one square abuts the next one, so these are the sunken 
They're not. They're not sunken. Is it still the cobble borders? Yep, still cobble borders. Nope. Called the waffle grids. These are not waffle grids. They're just rock borders. Roughly, what size is each? I'd say probably this room. Each one's the size of this room. Mm -hmm. If not bigger, oh. if not bigger. I'm not good with estimating size, but I know that grid squares are way bigger than you'd think they would be. Yeah. What size is the gravel as a mulch? Uh, into your thumb, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. There's been work trying to correlate the placement of grid fields on terraces or benches that already have gravel on them, but I haven't really seen that much of that kind of behavior. Um, mostly because there's these bare areas outside the cobble borders, and it seems like if ever if there were gravel everywhere. You just put another field there instead of having picked it all up and put it in your field and left that bare with and, and no cobble borders around it. So. Somebody invented a rake early. <laughs> Baskets and children, yeah. Okay, archaeological evidence of cotton farming. I told you there would uh, be a slide that shows where the sample of soil came from in this particular field. It's in that blue circle. These are two cotton pollen grains. This is the old one, if I can get it there. No, this one. The spines are all worn down. This is a brandy new cotton pollen grain, and you can see the spines are long and sharp. The other thing that you might be able to see is that the holes in the pollen grain, because this pollen grain has holes, are in a line, and they come back the other side. If you can imagine, I forgot to bring it as a prop, a baseball. The seam in a baseball is exactly how these holes are in this pollen grain. It's the only pollen grain I've ever seen that has the holes in that pattern. And in this new pollen grain, you have a line of holes here and then a line of holes there. So this comes around the back and it comes over here and around the back and comes over here. It's um, a really interesting pollen grain. So as it says, recovering cotton pollen, oh, because the flowers are only open for a brief time, like a day, maybe two, they, they fold up and fall away from the plant. So inside that fallen flower is all the pollen. And if that blows away, you have no evidence of cotton having been grown there. The bowl that encloses the cotton that covers the seeds has no pollen, no way of getting any pollen on it. So when you receive uh, when you recover cotton pollen from an open field, that is proof positive that cotton was grown in that area. Okay, so now we get to the facts. Uh, they have a place in the modern world, New World cottons, because grown in colors continue to be developed. They do not fade. They do not wash out. Um, they grow in marginal farmland, they provide jobs, they service niche markets, they, they retain um, and maintain genetic diversity, and they have desirable traits such as cold resistance and lint-free seeds. I didn't even get into this. Your old world cottons, the cotton fiber sticks to the seed. And that's why Eli Whitney had to come up with the gin saw to try to get the stuff off of the seeds because the slave sitting around trying to pull this off was not effective enough. New World cottons don't stick to the seed. And I wrote an article for a magazine for hand spinners uh, called, um, we make yarn, it's called Spin Off. And I wrote an article called, would history have been different if we'd known about an Anasazi cotton? Now we try not to use the word Anasazi anymore, it's ancestral Puebloan, but nonetheless, it's the same question. If we had known, if, if American culture had known about basically lint-free seeds where you can gin a whole lot of, of cotton just doing this, forget a machine, then maybe we wouldn't have had slavery. Maybe it would have changed seriously the course of history and, and the futures of very many, lots and lots of people on two continents, many continents. So you can today enjoy unique New World cottons we are one of the four states in the United States that are blessed to be able to receive aboriginal cotton seeds from native seed search in, in Tucson. I don't know if it's, if it's king cotton. I suspect it's king cotton. 
has restricted, prohibited the movement of those seeds beyond these four states. Okay, New, Me New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and Oklahoma. So I have, um, I recommend that people get Aboriginal Sacaton if you really want to perpetuate the original prehistoric cotton, but you can, probably can't grow it outdoors. I all, in fact, I grow all my cotton in pots in a sunroom and have for years. If you're not into growing things, you can buy your grown in color, weaving and knitting yarns and fabric from um, Sally Fox at Vraceace.com. And she, I like to steer business her way because without her, we would not know a lot of what I've told you about colored cottons. And she did it as a lark. She's not even a geneticist. And it's because the cotton, king cotton people are only interested in white cotton. So the world of colored cotton was wide open for her. Many, uh, her ideas and her techniques have been stolen by other industries and countries. So that's another reason I, I urge people to um, get something with the Fox Fiber copyright on it, or else you've got something that somebody has pirated from her. That's just not right. So closing thoughts. Two and a half centuries of changing climate, thousands of acres, river terraces, gently transformed into fields to grow. Oh, well, they harvest and store their own water, and they do this year round. So outside the growing season, they're storing snow melt. The important thing I forgot to mention about that aerial photo on Abiquiu Mesa with the uh, snow filled rectangles. That gravel mulch helps keep the snow from blowing away. Now, those of you that have lived in New Mexico for a while know that snow blows away. It doesn't always melt. And um, that's how they, they continue to, to harvest and store water in the off season is by trapping that snow. And I've shown you some slides of the most obvious grid fields that I could find because otherwise they're really pretty subtle. And I know people, I used to walk right over these things and never saw them, didn't see them for what they were, even though I was familiar with the idea of rocks out of place. So this is an incredibly subtle uh, reorganization of things that already happen on a landscape with a, 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 just a vast and deep, deep understanding of how water moves, how stones divert water, how plants take up water, and it's just an amazing accomplishment on the part of the ancestral Tewa people. So, as I say, uh, archaeological evidence seems limited to the ancestral Tewa homeland so far. That's that study area in that map. And irrigated farming is impossible, so they, they certainly understood life way better than we do now. So that, I think, is Did they it. Cotton and wool or? They didn't have wool until the Spanish brought sheep. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, the Spanish pretty quickly changed um, the Pueblo people's efforts from growing cotton into growing sheep, and um, from growing corn into growing wheat. And I thought that was a really interesting to study. Um, the Spanish needed wheat for the sacrificial host. And of course, if you've got priests along and the idea is to convert souls and save souls in the new world, then you've got to be able to serve, you know, celebrate mass. And you can't do it with a corn wafer. It's got to be wheat. So, <laughs> and, and the, the weaving of the cotton was done on the vertical looms, as I told you. And of course, the Spanish were familiar with treadle looms, the walking looms, mm -hmm. as you can see in, in Chimayo and other places. And Cotton is, uh, at least the aboriginal cottons, are low productivity. They'll grow just about anywhere, but they, they don't produce just bushels and bushels of, of cotton. So it takes time to add up enough cotton to get something made. Well, sheep, you know, they just walk around and they, all you do is shear them and then spin that and weave that on a Spanish loom. So that's why people were um, switched from caring for cotton, which has all kinds of ritualistic associations, to sheep with the wool and then sending those things off to Spain through Mexico as tribute. So it's, uh, it's interesting how you unpack uh, a religion and a technology from the Spanish side and compare that to the 
the pack that was being opened and, and, and used by the native people, and the one replaces the other, and it's, um, it's really total. It's, um, it's a phenomenon, a cultural phenomenon that is it's interesting. It's sad, but it's interesting. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's, there's different staple lengths. Mm -hmm. I think like the Pima cotton mm -hmm. is a long staple. Can you talk about the short versus the long? I mean, isn't the long got advantages for spinning or whatever? But and also, related to that, what, what function, what biological function do the cotton fibers serve? Okay. It's, in the, you've got a bowl there, right? The oh, I have lots of things there. Okay. Um, those are very good questions. The purpose of the lint on the seed is to uh, protect the seed underground, but the lint also absorbs water and helps that seed germinate. Now, there's talk about... Oh, so when it falls off and falls to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if, if we, we have to divorce ourselves from the notion of domesticated cotton, talk about the wild ancestors. Okay. Because the domesticated cottons in all cases have been designed to retain that, that bowl. Once it opens, it doesn't, the cotton doesn't fall out. It stays there until you can come and pull it out. Okay? So um, the, the wild, and they're almost lintless, almost no lint at all, very little cotton on the seeds of some of the very, of the, more primitive in, in a botanical sense. That's an okay word in, in botany. Uh, cottons, they, uh, they'll drop the seed and the little bit of lint can help them float to a new place. Okay, that's possibly what happened at some points within each of the spheres, the old world and the new world, with cottons before they were then domesticated and, and other factors selected for. So that's the purpose of the lint originally. We have capitalized on that by selecting for lots and lots of fibers on a seed. <coughs> okay? And your other question was? What, okay, the biological function you did, it, mm -hmm. it, it helps absorb water when mm -hmm. it does mm -hmm. fall and needs to, so it's kind of like a placenta of, <laughs> would you, of a? I guess, uh, I guess. It protects it, not really feeds it or nourishes no. it. No, okay. no. And it does grow from the seed coat itself. I mean, the seed coat protects the embryo. I mean, if anything were like a, a uterus or something, it seems like it would be that seed coat. Um, but you had another question, and, and it was related. Um, but, the staple length. Oh, staple length. Yeah, Hopi short staple cotton is about a quarter of an inch, and it cannot be spun by machine. That's why the agronomists in the early 20th century were so jazzed to make it longer, because they, they can see their, their crop time go down. They can see their... their their fertilizer and other investments go down and all the rest of this stuff because it's a miracle fiber. Um, and then your Pima is actually, the Pima cotton is a term of commerce. It's not developed by the Pima Indians. Um, it is a cross between Egyptian cotton and Sea Island cotton is my understanding, if I'm remembering this right. Now, Egyptian cotton. Two old worlds? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the Pima cotton. Um, Akela cotton or upland cotton is the new, the new world tetraploid, I think. And at this point, it's difficult to read the cotton literature because it's all about the hybrids that they've all made up. And to go back far enough to a uh, name that you would recognize is um, really hard to do. So I'm probably not giving you correct information to well, go. Well, so the longer stapled and the more it's easier to mm -hmm. machine spin. Yep. So when you have the short, it just it has to be done by hand. Yes, and it can be done by hand quite quite readily. Yeah. Yes. Could you describe the method of of spinning cotton? It seems like even cat hair might be easier. <laughs> <laughs> I brought a spinning kit with me, but I'm tied up with the microphone. Um, so when we get done with this, I'll show you some things. But on the machine end of things, um, there's been mechanical spinners being developed since the late 18th century. And all of them involved some hand effort at some point, or if nothing else, then to tie broken threads together. But now that's all taken care of by machines. And even the spinning itself now is done with like say air, 
Ring spun cotton you may have seen. Ring spun cotton is a very high grade of cotton. And what they do is they have an air jet that goes through a ring and it takes with it the cotton fibers. And as they go through here and twist, they're spun. So you have air and fiber coming in and yarn coming out, you know, untouched by human hands. It's just amazing. So it takes a, I guess that would take a longer fiber because otherwise it whoop, kind of kind of get lost. Spin mm -hmm. cotton. Yes. Would, just the same way you would spin wool. Yes. So you use a wheel, not a spindle. I, not a drop spindle. If you think about, um, yes, I do use a wheel. But for the shortest staple cotton, I use a spindle, but not a drop spindle. Uh, if you think of the Navajo spindle, big long guy, and you roll it up on your leg and the other end is on the ground, the miniature versions of those are spun in a cup. And the, the fastest of those spinning, and they are true little machines, come from India. And they are, they're weighted and centered just perfectly so you, you'll get it spinning in this little cup and it'll go 90 miles an hour for a minute. You know, 60 whole seconds, it's just like, I don't know anybody that can keep up with one, but it is meant for hand spinning. The, the, the idea is that cotton fibers are short. If you're thinking about how thick a yarn you're making, you need to make it thin enough so that each fiber in that yarn goes around that yarn at least twice. That way it has tensile strength. It won't pull apart. And if you've got short cotton fibers, then your thread from this has got to be really skinny for that little short fiber to go around that thread twice. If it's that skinny, it can't hold the weight of a drop spindle, and it has to be done with a support spindle. And just while we're on the topic, the, um, the big Navajo spindle was uh, taught, given to the Navajo by the Pueblo people who used it other way around to spin cotton. Now, the long end was not on the ground, it was on the leg. Or you might have been seated and have it across both legs, and you would roll that, and then and your whirl would be up here, the round part, instead of down there on the ground. And then you would spin off of your short end like this. Mm. You often see pictures of Gandhi yes. spinning. He used the cup? Or they have long staple cotton? Oh, no, they didn't have long staple. Um, what they did, they have a number of different spinning devices. They tend to be, they're variations on the wheel. So you have a charka, which is a horizontal deal, and you'll turn a drive wheel here that turns an intermediate wheel, and it's fastened to a spindle. So for every turn of the big wheel, this little guy goes around, I think that's like 700 times, something ridiculous. And it's a spindle, so it's not a uh, bobbin. It's, it's, it's like the thing that, that Snow White pricked her finger on. <laughs> so it's, it's just a pointy thing that comes out, and you this is going brrr, and you've got your little cotton thing, and while you're turning this, and this is going brrr, you're spinning out of your hand from a cotton preparation that is um, typical of Indian, India. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not, it's carded, but it's not just fluff. It's, it's carded and then rolled around a stick into a very tight organization called a puni. And you hold that, it's the size of a pencil. I mean, this could be a puni, a fat one. And it organizes the fibers such that you can spin with the one hand and not have it break or have big lumps in it or anything like that. So it's one-handed spinning. You reverse this a little bit and then you wind it back up on the little spindle and then you take another puni and you're at it again. So Gandhi was using that uh, most of the time. Well, typically that um, <coughs> Indian cotton is pretty thin, mm -hmm. uh, mainly I suppose because it's hot there and they don't need anything heavy, but um, that seems like you know weaving with threads yeah, well, just look at your own cotton shirts next time you're home and look at the size of those threads. Uh, they were spinning, the Indian spinners were making cotton that fine or finer. They were famous for um, taking a month to spin an ounce of cotton fiber because the thread was so fine and the fabric woven from it was transparent. In, in, in uh, Egypt, you, know, you see all mm -hmm. this see-through uh, linen. Linen, yeah. yeah. Really tiny. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, you have skilled artisans, they, they make room for them in the culture and, and, and in the society. Yes, sir? The aerial photograph mm -hmm. of the squares, do you happen to know how that picture was taken? Was it from a remotely piloted aircraft or was it from an airplane? Or? Airplane. Airplane. Um, Tim Stew, Stewie took that picture. 
He did. He did? Yeah. I thought it was Lindbergh. No, Lindbergh took lots of pictures of the grid field systems themselves, but he didn't take that picture. Um, Stu Peckham took that one. And that would have been 20, 30? 60s, Okay. Uh, almost 50 years, well, 50 years ago. Yeah. Yes. So is there an association of these farmers in these four states, um, an association or website or anything, those who are growing the New World cotton at this time? Not that I'm aware of, but Native Seed Search would know. So they're on the online and... Seed Search? Mm-hmm. I think it's Native Seed... Uh, seeds, maybe, plural. Maybe not plural, but it's nativeseed.com. And that they'll be happy to answer your question. Yes, ma'am. Wasn't Sally Fox almost put out of business? Yes. She was working in Arizona. And what was the threat? I mean, she was a single grower. <laughs> Cane cotton. Uh, she sold. At one point, she had uh, farmers in the panhandle of Texas growing nothing but her cotton. She provided the seed and bought their, product, their crop before it was planted. And it wasn't enough to, for those farmers to resist the, the seduction, the money, the whatever, the bribes of King Cotton. And they quit growing for uh, those cottons after just a couple of years. She had, she had trouble getting the gins to take her cotton because they said, well, it's too expensive to clean the drums of the gin between your colored cotton and the next batch of white cotton. And then the King Cotton said, well, your colored cotton, the pollen is going to contaminate our white crop and you can't have that. And it's not insect-carried pollen. It's built like, like insect-carried pollen, but it is a self-pollinating plant. So bees visit it, but it's after the fact. And so that goes for modern, you know, modern King Cotton as well. It's the same uh, flower ha habit of being open and then closing. She was raising brown cotton. I think the Texas farmers were raising the brown cotton. She sold all of that crop to Levi's, and they made it into brown denim, but only for the European market. They didn't want to mess with their blue market here in the U.S. And as you know, somebody with, that's watched commercials all my life, like everybody else, I can't believe that they would suffer from dividing their own market with a product they make in blue and brown. How do you lose? But they did. Uh, that and so we never saw any of that. She was having her her cotton spun in Italy and Japan. Uh, the Italians were weaving it into luxury fabrics, and all of her market for all of that was overseas. We never saw any of it. And yes, they did nearly drive her out of business by the mills would make her pay up front. Nobody has account that kind of money. Everybody else gets time payments after the fact because they understand that you have to sell your crop to pay for all the processes before that point. But no, she had to pay for everything up front. She's back in California. She found an angel to pay her debts. And she's been running some fundraising on Indiegogo. And I think you can still buy and help contribute toward her efforts. She's bought new equipment. <clears throat> she started uh, planting the colored cottons again in Cal California. It's all organic. And uh, it's an interesting thing. She has a closed loop with merino sheep. They graze the fields, they produce manure, she puts the manure on the cotton, the cotton grows. I think she does something with the, the, the waste product there with chickens or something. You know, it's a, she's got a, a really interesting operation going there. She's always been high-minded and future-oriented. And I'm just really grateful that she wasn't completely put out of business, but it was nip and tuck there. I went to visit her one time when she was still in Arizona. And she, um, she had a quote from Gandhi speaking of Gandhi, that basically says, first, first they ignore you, then they attack you, then they, then they, they do something else, and then you win. So, Sounds like Trump. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? If not, okay. we've got show and tell. We have show and tell. Yeah.